Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much uh, for being here. On behalf of Roger Williams University School of Law, we want to welcome you to our 16th annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture. My name is Ralph Tavares, and I serve as RWU Law's Director of Diversity and Outreach. I am thrilled to serve as your MC and moderator this evening. Before we begin, as always, I want to take a moment to reflect on the lands on which we reside. We are coming from many places physically and remotely, and we want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous and native peoples who have been here since time immemorial, and to recognize that we must continue to build our solidarity and kinship with native peoples across the Americas and across the globe. Roger Williams University School of Law is located here in Bristol, Rhode Island, and so we acknowledge and honor the Poconoke people and Soames, the original name of the land our campus resides on. We also acknowledge that this country would not exist if it wasn't for the free enslaved labor of black people. In this time of national reckoning with our history of slavery and the disparate treatment of black people, we honor the legacy of the African diaspora and black life, knowledge and skills stolen due to violence and white supremacy. While the movement for justice and liberation is building and we are witnessing the power of the people, many are still being met with violence and even being killed. As upholders of justice, our hope is to become agents of change for members of our society who have been met with violence, physical, mental, emotional, through our privilege, students, and soon practitioners of law. Today also, it is with great sadness that we honor the passing of one of the pioneers of Rhode Island that upheld this justice. We learn today of the passing of the Honorable Alton Wiley, Rhode Island's first black judge. Wiley graduated in 1951 from the University of Rhode Island, where he became a Hall of Famer in track and field. He participated in URI's Army ROTC program and did his active duty as a second lieutenant in France. He served in the U.S. Army Reserve from 1953 to 1979 and retired as Lieutenant Colonel. In 1980, Wiley was appointed to be Rhode Island's first African-American state judge. He later ascended to Superior Court before retiring in 1994. So we would like to take this moment as well before our program begins to honor Alton Wiley with a brief moment of silence and gratitude. Thank you very much. Tonight, we are honored to have the Honorable Chief Justice Richard Robinson join us for what should be an incredible fireside chat with his friend, our Dean, Greg Bowman. We will hear remarks from Chief Justice Robinson followed by what should be an incredible and timely fireside chat with Dean Bowman. And then we will open it up for Q&A to you all. I wanna thank our sponsor for this program, Nixon Peabody, for their generous contributions and work to combat systemic injustice. I am honored now to introduce senior counsel at Nixon Peabody, Andrew Prescott, to give a few remarks. Andrew Prescott, whose pronouns, pronouns are he and him, is a member of the firm's labor and employment group, advises clients on, clients on compliance and risk avoidance and handles employment disputes in mediation arbitration and litigation. Additionally, Andrew advises employers dealing with union organizing and National Labor Relations Board proceedings. Andrew is the leader of Nixon Peabody's National Labor Relations team and has served as the firm's Providence office managing partner. He is a member of the Me We Make Rhode Island Board of Directors. Andrew's current pro bono legal work includes providing legal counsel to two Boston-based bisexual advocacy organizations and representation of a Guatemalan refugee seeking permanent resident status through the Federal Immigration Court in Boston. Andrew, thank you so much for being here and thank you for your partnership. Ralph, well, thank you very much. Uh, Nixon Peabody enthusiastically uh, sponsors and supports this very important event and as well the upcoming diversity symposium uh, I look forward to both of these events very much every year, as do uh, my colleagues at Nixon Peabody. I, like everybody else, is, is anxious to hear from Chief Justice Robinson. So uh, let me uh, quickly hand the virtual mic over to my uh, colleague, Reka Shirovolu, who is our director, 
Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Nixon Peabody. Uh, she's just gonna say a few words and, and Reka, I'm passing the mic over to you. Thank you, Andrew. At Nixon Peabody, we strongly believe that diversity, equity, and inclusion are critically important to the future of the profession and our firm. Nixon Peabody aspires to become an international leader in workplace diversity. To achieve our goal, we continually work to realize our mission of recruiting, retaining, and promoting talented individuals from a broad range of racial, ethnic, social, economic, religious, and personal backgrounds, gender identities, and sexual orientations across the firm. This past year, the fight for racial equality and social justice affected communities and organizations across the globe. Members of our black community have been fighting for this for generations, and now the time has come to put words into action and stand with the black community in their fight for racial equality and social justice. This past summer, our firm leadership engaged in a series of important conversations with members of our black resource group to understand what their experience has been like in our organization and identify tangible ways we could do better to really build an inclusive organization where our differences are embraced and celebrated. These conversations are ongoing and there's much work to be done, but we wanted to show that we are willing to do this necessary work ahead. I thought I'd take this opportunity to share with you some of the DEI initiatives that we're proudest of at Nixon Peabody. In 2017, we launched um, Nixon Peabody's Diverse, Diverse Scholars Program, which is an internship program for second and third year law students from underrepresented backgrounds. This internship was initially piloted in our DC office and has been expanded to our Boston, Providence, Long Island, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York City, and San Francisco offices. Many of the students who worked with us as interns have now joined us as associates. We were also one of the first firms to ask attorneys to dedicate at least 40 hours a year to diversity related activities and counted that time towards their firm investment time requirements. We call this initiative Nixon Peabody's Diversity Challenge. We've recently evolved the diversity challenge to count that time towards billable hour requirements. Last year, Nixon Peabody was one of five law firms to pioneer the Move the Needle Fund, MTN as we call it. It was created by Diversity Lab. Move the Needle is a collaborative effort among law firms, in-house counsel and community leaders to create a more diverse and inclusive legal profession. Participating firms will work with more than 25 general counsel and community leaders to create a first of its kind experimental laboratory, investing over $5 million over the next five years to test research and data-driven ways to affect positive change through the legal profession. Nixon Peabody's main focus has been to increase the representation of women, racial and ethnic minorities, and LGBTQ plus attorneys in the equity partnership ranks. Our firm's commitment to diversity extends beyond the walls of our law firm. In addition to the work that we do internally to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, we regu regularly handle impactful pro bono cases that break down barriers to equity, inclusion, and diversity. We believe diversity, equity, and inclusion must be woven into all parts of our organization from the firm-wide strategic plan to our recruiting, retention, and advancement initiatives. Our partnership with Roger Williams has been incredibly rewarding for us as an organization. The work you've done to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion is really impressive. So thank you for including us in today's program and we look forward to continuing our partnership in the future. Wow, thank you so much, Rake. I'm just meeting you now, I can't wait to, to get to meet you a little bit more in the, in the very near future. And for those of you who don't know, 2019, Providence Business News awarded Nixon Peabody with their Diversity Leadership Award, and it's very evident why. So thank you once again for your partnership and for all that you do. Now I would like to introduce the person who doesn't really need an introduction, our Dean, Greg Bowman, who will introduce our keynote speaker and fireside chatter this evening. Greg. Thank you very much, Ralph, and welcome everyone. We are so glad to have you here with us this evening. Uh, it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce um, our wonderful speaker this evening, um, my friend, the Honorable Richard A. Robinson, uh, as our guest this evening for our 16th annual uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration keynote address. Chief Justice Robinson has lived a life and a career of public and judicial service. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from the University of Connecticut and his Juris Doctorate from the West Virginia University College of Law. And during his career, he has served the public as legal counsel for Stamford, Connecticut, and as a judge on the Connecticut State Judicial Branch, first as uh, a Superior Court judge, and then as an appellate court judge, and later as a justice of the Supreme Court. And since 2018, he has served as the court's chief justice in which role he is the head of the state's entire 
judicial branch. Chief Justice uh, Robinson is the first black chief justice in the state's history. So during his career, he's done a lot of wonderful and amazing things. He has served the public, uh, of course, in his roles in state government, and he's served the public in numerous other ways as well, uh, including uh, as president of the Stanford, Connecticut branch of the NAACP, as general counsel for the Connecticut Conference of the NAACP, as commissioner and chair of the Connecticut Con Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities, as a member of the state's uh, Lawyers Assistance Advisory Board, as a member of the National Conference of Chief Justices Executive Committee, and as chair of the Judicial Task Force of that National Conference of Chief Justices Civil Justice Committee and more. For his excellence in his service throughout his career, Chief Justice Robinson has received numerous awards, including the Connecticut Bar Association's Henry J. Narek Judiciary Award for Integrity, the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities Alvin W. Penn Award for Excellence in Leadership, and Ebony Magazine's Power 100 Award. Uh, selection as well as one of the NAACP's 100 Most Influential Blacks in Connecticut. So in short, Chief Justice Robinson is living proof of the maxim that it is possible and indeed noble to make a profound difference as a member of the legal profession. That is something that all lawyers strive to do, and he certainly does so in his daily living and career. We're proud to have him here with us this evening. Now, on a personal note, uh, as Ralph mentioned, I'm very proud, and as I mentioned, I'm very proud to call Chief Justice Robinson a friend and indeed uh, a role model for me. He and I first met uh, when he spoke at his alma mater, the West Virginia University College of Law, while I was the dean there. And I was struck by his presence, by his poise, by his intellect, by his conviction in all that he does. And those impressions remain, and in fact, have grown throughout the years. He shoulders great responsibilities in his role as Chief Justice, and he does so with his keen intellect and his strong belief in our power to do good in the world as lawyers. So Mr. Chief Justice, we are fortunate to have you here with us today. Thank you for being here. We look forward to your remarks and then we look forward to a conversation between you and me after that. The podium is yours. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I wanna thank all of you at Roger Williams University Law School for the tremendous honor of addressing you today at the 16th annual MLK lecture. Dr. King is one of my personal heroes and it is tremendously humbling to have the opportunity to celebrate him at this event. I also wanna thank Dean Bowman and Mr. Tavares for inviting me, but I must admit that back when I originally started talking to Dean Bowman about coming to Roger Williams and meeting you, it was pre-pandemic and I was really looking forward to spending time on your beautiful campus. Hopefully one day we will be able to meet in person and continue the conversation that we start here today. This is the 16th annual MLK lecture. And like most black Americans who are alive at the time, I can remember the moment when I heard the news that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. That day when his voice was silenced, but his words and his actions entered eternity. A lot has changed since then, but too much remains the same. I would suggest to you that in showing us the way, Dr. King has raised the bar for every single one of us in this virtual room. And we owe it to him, ourselves, our country, to strike out on that path that he blazed in order to achieve the justice and fairness that all of us deserve. In doing so, however, do not deceive yourself. There will be times when you must draw upon your reservoir of courage, as many of us did before. Dr. King, as Dr. King so aptly observed, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step towards the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The tireless exertions of passion and concern of dedicated individuals. Once again, are we are in one of those uneasy periods where the national conversation on politics, religion, race, culture, gender, and sexuality is causing us all a good deal of angst. There has been pushback on the advancements that we've made in the last few decades. I would be lying to you if I said that I was not concerned about what has, what has been going on. Yes, I have seen pushbacks before. In fact, there have always been pushbacks after times of great achievements in social justice, like the passage of the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, 
or the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote, or the repeal of the separate but equal doctrine and the recognition of marriage equality as a constitutional right. Like you, I have witnessed what is going on and I've been feeling a wide range of emotions like anger, fear, grief, and yes, even despair. Last December, I turned 63 years old. I tell you my age because I have lived through one of the most remarkable periods of our country's history. To quote Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. My life is bookended by the horror of the racially motivated torture and killing a 14 year old child. An event that not only um, would have a major impact on my own life, but would start the civil rights movement that Dr. King would lead. A movement that would eventually lead to the election of the first black president, Barack Obama, and more recently, the election of Vice President Kamala Harris, the first black woman, who, by the way, identifies as Jamaican American, Caribbean American, Asian American, Indian American, South Asian descent, and her pronouns are she, her, and hers. On a Sunday morning in August 1955, in a little town of Money, Mississippi, a frightened 14 year old black child named Emmett Bobo Till endured a night of unimaginable ter terror and pain at the hands of two white men, J.W. Millam and his half-brother, Roy Bryant. In his final moments on earth, the last thing that Bobo heard from Milliam was him ordering him to pick up a 74-pound Jenny fan wheel. As Milliam Bryant later confessed, the child staggered under its weight as he carried it to the riverbank. He lowered the wheel to the ground and silently stared at his tormentors. Millen told him to take off his clothes. Slowly, Bobo pulled off his shoes, his socks. He stood up, unbuttoned his shirt, dropped his pants and his shorts. He, there stood, he then stood there naked in the Sunday morning, a little before 7 a.m. Millen asked him, do you still think you're as good as I am? Bobo said yes. As much as they had tortured him, Bobo, a mere child, refused to back down and submit. This was simply too much for Millen to take. And a second later, he squeezed the trigger of his 45. A shot rang out and a bullet tore through Bobo's head. His night of torture had finally ended. His severely beaten, mutilated and castrated body was found three days later at the bottom of the river, tied to that very Jenny wheel that he'd been forced to carry. I was born two years after Emmett Till was murdered. The world that I was born in is much different from the one that we live in today. As a very young child, one of the first things that I remember was my mother telling me, and sometimes even pleading with me, to be careful, to mind myself, to remember what happened to Emmett Till. You see, mom was very concerned for my well-being. Unlike my brothers and my cousins, I had this habit of openly questioning things that I felt were unjust. It just didn't make sense to me that it was acceptable for people to be treated differently because of the color of their skin. I simply could not accept that there were laws on the books prohibiting people who looked like me from staying in public accommodations, from marrying who we loved if they were of a different race, from riding on trains and buses, from eating at the lunch counter. While many of you may see that as an admirable quality, admirable quality in a young person, it was the late 50s and early 60s, and things were quite different back then. That kind of thinking in a black child literally could be deadly. Every year, my family would take a 13 hour, 800 mile drive from Stanford, Connecticut to my parents, grandparents' farm in Orangeburg, South Carolina. I very fondly remember those trips. We would pack things into a cardboard shoe box, things like tangerines and bread and fried chicken and pound cake. We would then stop in White Plains, New York to pick up my Aunt Pearl and then meet my uncles Legrand and Walter at the toll plaza at the beginning of the New Jersey Turnpike. We then trail each other in separate cars down I-95 to Washington, DC, then eventually to Route 301, a rural one lane each way road that meandered through some very small and obscure towns. Interstate 95 had not been completed at that time. As we headed south, my mother and her siblings would talk about the joys and pains of growing up in a large black family in the south. My mother was the second youngest of 11 children living in a three bedroom house, a three room house, one room for the girls, one room for the boys, and one room for my grandparents. Things on the drive were rather normal until we got to Maryland House, a rest stop on I-95. We would stop there and use the bathroom facilities. 
The adults would fill the tanks with gas and we'd go to the next leg of our journey. We had just crossed the Mason Dixon line. And even as a child, I realized the rest of the trip was somehow different. The adults were more on edge, more cautious, more careful in their words that they chose when speaking to people who did not share our dark hues. We didn't stop at motels or restaurants and with rare, ex rare exceptions, we no longer took for granted that we could even use the restroom at the gas stations. As peculiar as things were, my world was not as bad as it was my family members who came before me. Unlike my paternal great, great grandparents, I did not know the pain and personal indignities of slavery. Unlike my maternal grandfather, Edward, who we called Papa, I never had to search for and find the body of a little brother who was lynched because someone felt that he respect, disrespected them. I didn't have to feel the pain that Papa felt when he saw German prisoners using white only water fountains that he and any person of color would have gone to jail, been beaten or even killed for using. Unlike my mother who had to walk miles and miles to the colored schoolhouse while the white children were driven by her in school buses. You see, busing wasn't really a problem. Busing was an acceptable method of transportation for children going to school until it wasn't. No, I didn't have to bear these type of indignities. I didn't have to deal with them. But even during my lifetime, Jim Crow's laws were still in force. Churches were bombed, little black girls were murdered and civil rights warriors were slain. Even as a child, I felt the injustices of others during the turbulence of the civil rights movement. And I recoiled at images of dogs and fire hoses used to attack civil rights demonstrators. My heart grieved with the loss of four little girls who died in the bombing of the 16th Street Church. I was angered by the assassination of chap NAACP chapter president Vernon Dahmer and NAACP field secretary Medgar Evers, shot dead because they dared to help black Mississippians get the right to vote. Yet amid the chaos and turmoil was a steady presence of Dr. King. Frederick Douglass pointed towards the North Star. Dr. King followed it through the streets of Atlanta, Montgomery, and Selma, from a jail cell in Birmingham into the steps of our nation's most distinguished monuments. From my perspective, Dr. King's greatest attributes may be summarized in three phases. Three phrases. He inspired, he persisted, and he kept his faith. It is a rare speech these days that does not include a quote from this gifted and talented and eloquent leader. I am hard pressed to read anything he said without a chill going from the base of my neck to the bottom of my spine. Consider his words on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1963. In a sense, we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our Republic wrote the magnificent words of the constitution and the declaration of independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men would be guaranteed the inalienable right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on that promissory note insofar as her, children, her citizens of color are concerned. Indeed, Instead of honoring the sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe the bank of injustice is bankrupt. The bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity in this nation. So we have come to cash this check, a check that will give us demand, will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and security of justice. And while he must have had moments of anger and despair through his great struggle, Dr. King's faith remained strong. Faith in this country, faith in his ideals, faith in the rule of law, and faith in the goodness of people. To his core, Dr. King believed and never lost hope, as evidenced by his speech that he gave in April 3rd, 1968. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Dr. King was assassinated a day later. It was a crushing day for my family and for my community. I clearly remember the heaviness in my, ch heaviness in my chest upon seeing the tears that flowed from my mother's eyes. What would we do without him? So let me tell you what we did. We took on the mantle of inspiration, persistence, and faith. It was a challenge I ultimately took upon myself. 
I was well, not quite sure what it, where I would end up, but I knew it would be somewhere where I could make a difference. I didn't realize until much later that all the events I'd experienced in my youth fell into place, leading me to the realization that courts could be a powerful force in making things right. Brown versus Board of Education and the court's role in the admission of James Meredith to the University of Mississippi are but two examples. And more locally and personal to me, I hope that State versus Holmes, a decision that I authored for the, Superior, for the Supreme Court in Connecticut will be a third. And I'll talk about that case later. But I, first I needed to get my education. I graduated from the University of Connecticut with my bachelor's degree from West Virginia College of Law with my law degree. I returned to Connecticut full of enthusiasm and ready to find a job. And unfortunately, however, the landscape for black attorneys was much different in the 1980s than it is now. And we were not readily accepted into established law firms. I could not find a job. I began to despair. But with the help of a mentor and a much needed pep talk, I landed a job as staff counsel for my, home, my hometown, the city of Stanford, Connecticut. I went on to serve as assistant corporation counsel and suffice it to say, the place where I worked was not exactly accepting in the beginning. I remember my first meeting with the Board of Representatives, the legislative body that I represented. It wasn't but a couple of minutes before I heard somebody say in a not so low side whip, uh, stage whisper, I guess I'll have to learn Swahili. Another city official upon hearing that I had been assigned to represent her in court complained that I was not experienced enough to represent her. The corporation counsel gave me her unwavering support and refused to take me off the case. I subsequently won, and I considered telling my client that it would never, ever represent her again. But I decided not to do that and went on to win every case that I represented her in. I don't know what I savored more, winning the cases or the look on her face when I did. During this period of my life, I also had the great honor of serving as the president of the Stanford branch of the NAACP. NAACP and the General Counsel for the Connecticut Council of the NAACP. I found it a tremendous way of giving back to the community that had given me so much. Simultaneously, more and more people of color were entering professional ranks of public service as government organizations recognized the need to have a staff that reflected the faces and voices of the people that they served. There also is a, was a recognition of, of needing judges of color on the bench. And in 2000, I was appointed to the Superior Court. 2007, the Appellate Court. 2013 to the Supreme Court and 2018 Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And by some strange coincidence, most of those appointments or nominations were made on my birthday. I've never been able to figure that one out. As many of you will learn at, as you age, gratitude for what's good in your life grows with every decade. To say that I'm grateful to have the opportunity to serve the people of my home state as Chief Justice would be a vast understatement. When I was born, it was improbable, if not impossible, for my parents to ever think that their son would become the first black person to become an attorney representing the city, the fifth black person to sit on the Connecticut Appellate Court, the fourth black person to be appointed to the Connecticut Supreme Court, and the first black person ever to sit as Chief Justice. It's not lost on me that I've held these positions, not because I was the first black person qualified to do it, but because I was the first black person given the opportunity to do it. My nominations were made by Democrats and Republicans. And it's not lost on me that when Governor Malloy nominated me to the position of Chief Justice, the General Assembly, Republicans, Democrats, and unaffiliated, men and women, black, white, and brown, Asian and Latino, unanimously affirmed the nomination of a black man to become the Chief Justice. It was an incredibly humbling moment, but one of which I am very proud. It has been a long, tough road for our people and our country. But as my wife, Nancy, often reminds me, the struggle for America to live up to its promises, or if you will, to deliver on its promissory note, is not a sprint, but a marathon. And to this marathon, I bring to the table a reverence of the rule of law. If there's anything that will save this democratic republic, that will sustain the water America's promise of liberty and justice for all, it is the rule of law. While that term is ambiguous, is ambiguous and means different things to different people. When I talk about it, I mean that basic agreement that we have made with each other that neither our government nor any man or woman shall be above the law and that everyone has a fundamental inalienable right to be treated equally. Now I recognize that as a country we are facing significant challenges to the rule of law. Too many people have lost trust and confidence in the government and hateful and violent words are more readily digested and advocated upon. 
Sometimes it seems that every day things are getting worse. In our busy lives, we turn to video clips and sound bites for news, and let the tenor of those brief snippets shape our outlook. Our mood is at the mercy of headlines, news feeds, and 140 character messages. But my faith in the rule of law runs deep, as does my commitment to upholding it. Our courts have no power of the purse to enforce our rulings, nor do we have armies or police force. Rather, a judge's order carries weight because people have faith in the institution and faith in the court's solemn oath to protect their rights, even if they lose their case. A lack of civility and negative discourse erodes our social compact with those we serve. And today's polarizing rhetoric weakens our democracy. We must protect this foundation upon which our most cherished values rest and rebuild the public's trust and confidence brick by brick to strengthen our underpinnings. Moreover, I believe that many of the dedicated ind uh, individuals that Dr. King spoke about during his speeches were and are a part of our legal system. Yes, the system is flawed and in some ways deeply flawed, but that which is created by humankind certainly almost always is. The war on drugs in urban areas and the creation of the prison industrial complex has had a disparate impact on people of color, as well as the poor and the disenfranchised. It has also had a devastating impact on our communities. Add to this the elements of past government sanctioned discrimination, as well as the implicit and explicit bias in everything from A to Z. By the way, I highly recommend that you read a book titled The Color of Law, The Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. It was written by Richard Rothstein. It's a fascinating book and it explains why we have the housing patterns and that we have today and why discrimination in the 50s is a problem even to this day. No, neither our country or our courts are perfect. But from the inside looking out, I can assure you that there are many, many committed individuals with the court system who embrace and recognize the necessity of diversity. In fact, I'm proud to report that I have led Connecticut state courts diversity and cultural competency trainings for judges, attorneys, court staff, and all stakeholders that use or come in contact with our court system, including but not limited to prosecutors, public defenders, assistant attorney generals, assistant United States attorneys, the Connecticut bar and local bar associations. Our programs have received national recognition and I've literally been all over the country doing trainings for judiciaries in the area of cultural competency, implicit bias and racial anxiety. Nevertheless, I am constantly thinking of the journey ahead and confess that I do some of my best thinking in my hour long commute from Hartford to my home in Stratford, Connecticut. On one of those recent rides, I remember listening to a station on satellite radio called Soul Town and a 1991 R&B song was playing called Round and Round. It was written by Prince and sung by Ke uh, Tevin Campbell. And my thoughts started swirling. I thought about how the world has changed since Dr. King got started in the civil rights movement. I thought about Mecker Evers and the many other civil rights warriors we lost through acts of violence. I thought about a note that Mecker's widow, Merrily Evers Williams wrote me, congratulating me when I became chief justice and reminding me of the work of Mecker Evers. I thought about what's going on in our country today. I thought about Emmett Till, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice. I thought about people like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tatiana Jefferson, Philando Castile, Elijah McClain. I thought about Selma. I thought about Ferguson. I thought about the promise of a new era when a clear majority of American voters, Democrats, Republicans, unaffiliated, men, women, black, white, brown, Asian, and Latino, elected their first black president only to subsequently think about the current backlash to that wonderful historic moment. I thought about the rise of the alt-right and other hate groups entering to the mainstream, wearing the garb of normalcy, but in clothing and in rhetoric, the hoods were gone, but the hate was still there. I thought about the acceptance and deafening silence of the people who I thought were my allies or even my friends. Against this backdrop, I began to despair until I really started listening to the words of that song. The lyrics kept drawing me in and they went something like this. I say nothing comes from dreamers, but dreams. I say sitting idle in our boat while everyone else is down the stream. Nothing comes from talkers but sound. We can talk all we want to, but the world still goes around and around. And then it came to me, it dawned on me. I realized that Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream sermon wasn't something static in time. It was a vision that a dreamer had over 40 years ago about a day that may never come. 
but it also dawned on me that his dream hasn't been deferred. Rather, it's been left for all of us to carry out. You see, Dr. King was more than a dreamer. He was a person of action who inspired generations to do the same. There is a reason that his quotes are often used in speeches throughout the years, and that's because they still resonate with us and they still mean something. And it means, it means something is to do something. When you get a chance, please reread the I Have a Dream sermon. Please note it does not start with his dream, but with the inspiration of America as it was when I was born, a country in crisis and a call to action to save it. Dr. King is no longer physically with us, but his dream and his call to action remains. Yes, some great things have happened since he was called home. People of color have obtained heights that were unthinkable during his lifetime. While there have been many successes, there have also been many troubling failures. Look at the plight of our cities, our deeply troubling economic and racially divided public school systems, our prisons. And I think we can all agree that you wouldn't have to look too long or too hard to see that we have failed some of the most vulnerable people in our society. We have come a very long way, but we have all so far to go. There's a lot of hard work to do. And as Dr. King said in his last sermon, we've got some difficult days ahead. But I know that Dr. King would not have us rest on our laurels, not even for a minute. The journey ahead will require vision and courage. And only then will we begin to make inroads to the problems that we still must confront. Only then will we bring this country to a new level of justice. I am confident that we can do it. And this is my final message to you today. Just as Dr. King called upon us to do, be inspired, be persistent, keep the faith. The task before us is mighty, but so is our commitment. As he so Ill eloquently said, the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chief Justice. We appreciate you being here with us this evening. And um, your words give us a lot to think about. Um, I, I'm struck before we start our chat here. You know, words matter. Words have meaning. We're lawyers. We make our living with words. We imbue those words with meaning, and we try to make sure that people live up to them when we're doing our best. We do. So I have some questions for you, and you have words of wisdom in your answer for us. Uh, and again, thank you so much for being here. It's, it's great to see you. I'm sorry we're not in person, but we're going we're gonna to get you here in person sometime, sometime soon, as soon as we can. I'll be there. Okay. So you did make history uh, in 2018 when you were appointed after an already distinguished career um, in state government or in, um, in city government and then in state government in the, in the judicial branch. Uh, when you became the first Black Chief Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court. Uh, and you have made um, part of your mission in that position to be a strong advocate for social justice uh, and for equal access uh, to, to justice. And I'd like for you to talk a little bit about this with us and talk about how it informs you and guides you in your role as Chief Justice. Um, th thanks, that's a very good question. Um, one of the things that I decided when I became a judge is that I would take all of me onto the bench. And by that, I mean all of my experience, everything that is me, um, because that was necessary. You didn't want just a person with brown skin on the bench. That wouldn't do anything. Um, and so when I looked at cases, um, believe me, I followed the law. I, I totally believe in the rule of law. There were times when I had to hold my nose and make a decision because I thought uh, this isn't exactly fair, but this is where the law takes me. Um, but the fact that I was doing it as a black man with all my experience actually added something to it. And that became even more important when I started working um, what I would call the multi-headed hydra scenario, scenario when I was on the appellate court. Um, I could actually talk to the other justices and say, wait a minute, have you ever looked at it this way? Um, and take my experience and talk about that. Uh, it became really interesting uh, when we decided a search and seizure case. It was a, a case involving a black man living in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, and the police would describe this area of Bridgeport as a high crimes area. 
And I finally had to ask the state's attorney, what does that mean? <laughs> what, what is a high crime area? And what do you do differently there? And so they thought that the type of policing that went on there was proper. And they said, but you're turning the citizens in that area against you. The way to get good results in your police enforcement is to work with the community, not against the community. If you have a quote unquote high crime area where you start rousting people just because they happen to live there, what results are you going to get? Uh, so if, if I were, I would take a look at State versus Edmonds because I actually wrote a concurring opinion in that case. And it's, it's odd for a couple of different reasons. It's a concurring opinion with more justices joining it than the majority. But I had to convince my clerk <laughs> after many, many arguments that it was dicta, you know, what I was writing. And so it wasn't necessary for the holding, but it was necessary for what I needed to say. Um, and it just was weird that so many other justices joined it. But by bringing that experience to the court, um, I have to tell you the reaction of defense attorneys and even prosecuting attorneys was unexpected by me. They start to see things in a different way, a different light, a different way of thinking. And I think that the diversity on the bench actually helps that, it promotes that. The homogenous thinking is echo chamber thinking and you, you gotta get away from that. I mean. Uh, when I hire clerks, oh, by the way, here's my plug for clerks. <laughs> um, I hope that uh, everyone out there considers clerking with us. We got two of the most incredible people to clerk with us from your school, uh, Chris Moran and Nicole Rohr. And I hope that they are listening. Um, they were incredible and we, we want more of them. Well, that's, it, it, there's, a, there's a saying that I have grown quite fond of and I think is deeply impactful, which is to talk about the shadow of a leader, the, the, the way that one's actions and statements are accentuated when you're in a position of authority. And it sounds like you're leading from the bench uh, in the way that you are, you are asking and expecting people to look at things in, in, in broader, better ways. I am. I am. And I, I do that for all the, the, the justices and judges. Bring who you are to the courtroom, because if you don't, and this is sort of, if you think about how courts used to work, we're told, no, don't do that. When you hang up and you put on that robe, leave who you are in that, that uh, chamber. Um, but the truth of the matter is we always bring some of ourselves out to the bench. I just say, be more aware of it. Right. So, so you, it sounds like you love being a judge. Absolutely. Did you always want to be a judge? Was no. Plan? What, what no. <laughs> I had no plans of being a judge whatsoever. I loved being a litigator. There was no life to me better than being a litigator. Um, although one of my coworkers recently reminded me when I told him um, he's also a judge, um, I said, you know, I really miss litigation. And he just looked at me kind of strangely and he said, why? And I said, uh, you know, waiting for that jury to come out. And sometimes you hear them in there arguing and, you know, uh, that moment, that adrenaline rush when the jury says, you know, uh, judgment for the defendant. And he, he kept staring at me and he says, you, you do remember you had a migraine every single trial. <laughs> and he was absolutely right. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I forgot about that. Um, but I, I've loved, the law has been very good to me. I've loved every position I've had and thought that when I was there, there was nothing better. And then I would get a different position. It was like, and then I feel the same way. There's nothing better. Um, and right now I, I, you know, I love my job. I absolutely love it. There are days where it's, it's, it's not easy, but I love it. Um, I, um, let's turn to, let's talk about juries. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, the role of juries and waiting for the jury to come out. Uh, the, the American judicial system is the right to trial by a jury of your peers. Um, and so jury selection is, is critically important to the judicial process uh, and much can go wrong there. So you recently launched a jury selection task force in Connecticut uh, that has made recommendations for systemic jury reform. And yes. we'll share some thoughts and comments about that work. Um, let me tell you the, the, my personal background for that. Uh, 
when I was trying cases, after a while, I started noticing that attorneys would strike black jurors off of my cases. And I couldn't figure out why. I'm sitting there going, my client isn't black. Um, I don't get this. It took a while to dawn on me that they were afraid that black jurors were somehow going to connect with me as a black man. Think about how absurd that is. Um, they didn't have that sort of a bias towards a white juror with them, but they thought somehow a black person would be biased towards me. And I know it wasn't my imagination because there was an incident where it became explicit. I was trying a case courtside and Ken Pavada, the, the gentleman I told you about earlier, was trying a case before the jury and I had helped him prep the, the case. And we always try to do cases together. I would sit second chair for him, he'd sit second chair for me. Um, my case was above the fold, very political, uh, just one of those nerve wracking cases. Um, I finally finished my case and I had a migraine, um, but I went into the courtroom where he was and I, he called me to the defense table and I sat down and we started discussing the witness who was testifying, but I said, I have a migraine, I, I, I can't do this. So he said, don't worry, I got it. And I went home. It ended up being a plaintiff's verdict for over $400,000. so it was one that hurt pretty badly. A few weeks later, the attorney for the plaintiffs called me and was really angry with me. And I couldn't figure out what it was at first. And I said, and he mentioned the case name. And I said, I wasn't on that case. And he said, yes, you came into the room. And I go, yeah, I did for a few minutes. And he said, uh, I can't believe you did that. And I said, and I thought he was joking. I said, do what? I, I do a lot of crazy things. And he said, try to influence a juror. And I go, wait a minute, hold it, hold it. You're literally accusing me of a crime. I need to know exactly what you're talking about. So he says, the black juror. And then I'm, I started to think, and there was a black man in the front right. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're saying the only reason I came in that room was somehow this to influence this black guy by my mere presence. And he said, yes. And I was horribly offended. And I said, so if Deborah, who was the only female in our office, if she had come down there, she would have been there to influence the female jurors. And he said, yes. So I looked at him and I said, I guess you were there to influence the short white males. And he was quite upset over that. Um, I almost quit. I came very close to leaving the practice of law that day because I realized that my mere presence would hurt my client. And it took um, my boss at the time, Mary Summer, who became Judge Summer, uh, it took her a while to talk me into staying and that the problem wasn't mine, the problem was his. So I took that and I built on that, but I also took those memories with me when I became a judge and when I became Chief Justice. So this case, State versus Holmes comes up and there's a Batson challenge. And the juror um, was a social worker who's a black man who grew up in an urban area. And they asked him, had he ever had any negative uh, interaction with the police? In Connecticut, you have individual voir dire. I think we're the only state left where you have a right to individual voir dire. And he said, yes, I've been pulled over and um, uh, driving while black kind of a thing a few times. And uh, the, the prosecutor then said, can you be fair? And he said, yes. Then they asked him, uh, you have any relatives who had problems with the police? He said, well, I, had, uh, I can't remember what the relative was, a cousin or something who had been arrested. And, well, how did they make you feel? Well, he stole something. He needed to go to jail, um, which seems like an appropriate answer to me. Um, the prosecutor ended up striking him from the jury because he thought that he would be biased against police officers, despite the fact that the man said he wouldn't be. And one of the things the jury task force actually recommends is that you can't use those reasons to strike anybody anymore. Think about this. I've been pulled over many times by police officers, not just in Connecticut and when I was traveling out of state, when I was going to school in West Virginia, it, it happened. I would be disqualified from sitting on any jury, not because of something I did, but because of how the system treated me. That can't be fair that you knock out an entire portion of the population. So I created this jury task force. And in, in that case, uh, State versus Holmes, we actually had to affirm the trial court because Batson deals with explicit discrimination, not implicit bias. 
So we put the task force together to deal with this. And the task force also deals with things like blacks are underrepresented in the jury pool. And we start looking at reasons for that. Why are they? Um, we start looking at things, they start looking at things like um, paying jurors more money when the employer won't pay them when they have to come in to do jury duty. Looking into the possibility of providing childcare for jurors who come in. In other words, make just because you are economically challenged shouldn't be a reason why you're, you're knocked out of jury duty. People are entitled to a jury of their peers. As I said during my keynote speech, people are entitled to equality. People are entitled to fairness. And if they're not given that, they won't trust the system anymore. And our power comes from their trust. That's really interesting to, to come at the challenge from several angles. It's not, it's not just jury selection. It's the ability to serve on a jury and not be disadvantaged severely by it. Right. Absolutely. So, Chief Justice, you've mentioned several times this evening about your mentors and what people may not know who are watching tonight is that that uh, you and I share a mentor uh, in Professor Jim Friedberg at the West Virginia University College of Law, uh, yes. someone who's been deeply influential in my career um, and I also consider a friend. So, um, you know, mentors make a lot of the difference uh, in whether we succeed or not. Um, any other stories about mentors or any, any advice for our, our, our listeners and watchers tonight about finding um, and supporting your mentors to become your mentors? Well, um, well, the easy part of that equation is this, be a mentor, be a mentor. What I've done over the years is when I find somebody who I think would make an excellent judge, I start talking to them, grooming them, telling them what they should do in order to get the proper training to become a judge. The bench in Connecticut has really diversified over the past few years. There was one, and I, I just talked to Courtney today, Judge Chaplin. Uh, judge Chaplin was a clerk uh, of one of my fellow judges at the, when I was on the appellate court and uh, just really good at his job and just really a good guy. So I started asking him, have you ever considered being a judge? And he, he looked at me and he says, I'm 30. <laughs> and I go, wait a minute, are you saying that I'm old because I'm a judge? And um, I started talking and he was very resistant at first, but I said, Courtney, this governor is looking for diversity on the bench. Your age actually is one of those assets that we could really use. You see the world in an entirely different way than I do. And we could really use that experience on the bench. Lo and behold, he went through the process. In Connecticut, you have to go through a jury select, I'm sorry, not jury selection. You have to go through a, a judge's uh, selection commission. Once you're approved by that, you can be nominated by uh, the, the governor. And then you have to be approved by the General Assembly. So we are nominated and appointed. And that actually gives us a buffer between us and politics. And I think that's very good. But he made it through judicial selection. And sure enough, within a couple of months, he was tapped to become a judge. Uh, and so I'm so proud of him. And he still calls me to you know, this day um, for advice and things like that. So mentors, mentoring is important, but having a mentor also is important. There's two people at West Virginia University that changed my life. One was Jim Friedberg and the other one was Mark Rothstein. Both of these gentlemen, for reasons that they know best, decided to become my mentor. That connection really helped me, not only through law school, I still have those connections. I talked to Professor Rothstein. Um, I was in the middle of doing a case involving uh, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I started doing some research and I saw Laura Rothstein. I go, that can't be the Laura Rothstein who's the wife of Mark Rothstein. And so I look it up and sure enough, it was her. So I give Professor Rothstein a call. And, uh, you know, we reconnected and uh, it's just been great. So that mentoring relationship is extremely important and they last a lifetime. They do. I just, I just emailed Jim Freeberg a couple of days ago and said that you would be with us tonight. And he says, hello. Okay, he's thank you. And he's proud of you. So um, speaking of helping to, to shape people and futures, what, what advice do you have um, as a lawyer and a highly successful judge for my colleagues and me at the law school, the faculty and staff at the law school? 
Um, what do we need to do better than we're doing in order to ensure that all of our students succeed, especially in this really challenging moment in our nation's history? I, I think the first thing I have to say is it's not just all about the books. Law school, or I guess in these days, the electronic uh, information. Um, law school teaches you a whole different way to think. You know, when you come out of law school, you are not the same person who went into law school. And that's good for our profession. But you also have to be, find ways to find balance. You have to be more well-rounded because these things that are going around on around us, this world that's constantly changing, we have to have an active role in engaging in that and changing that and doing things with that, interacting with it. And I think one of the things that can happen is law school can, can become very monastic and you just start concentrating on what's under that roof. That's not the right approach. I think the better approach is doing things that some of the schools are now, do clinics, reach out, help the people that need to be helped. Um, we have been disconnected from our society in a lot of different ways, especially the court systems. We have to reconnect with it. We have to reconnect with the real world. We have to deal with the social problems of today. And that's not going to be easy. That's going to be tough uh, because we won't agree on all this stuff. But here's the other thing about this wonderful book, being a lawyer. You learn how to argue about that. You learn how to civilly engage and discuss things. And you know what? If my idea is the better idea, I'm going to take my idea to the marketplace and I'm going to beat you. And when I beat you, you're going to see why that happened. And we're still going to be friends. We're going to, we're going to be like the old uh, the lawyers that I used to know when I practice, we can go to court, fight tooth and nail. Hey, where are you going to lunch? Oh, we can't go to the jury's going to be there. Let's go to this place instead. Um, that's what I loved about lawyering. Um, it requires a lot more civility than what we have now. Um, that's, that's the other thing, but Lawyering is, is it's, it's a life kind of a thing. It's not just a profession. And I think we need to get better at teaching new lawyers about that. You know, I think that's true. So, so two final questions for you. I've, I've asked for your, your help and guidance for faculty and staff. What about our students who have decided maybe tonight, maybe earlier, that they want to have a career in the judiciary. What advice do you have for them besides working in the Connecticut state courses? <laughs> well, get a very well-rounded education. And by that, I mean, if you go to your local government, find out what commissions, boards, agencies are looking for volunteers, um, get involved in that. You don't have to get in the political part of it. Um, I didn't. I you know, I just didn't go that route. Uh, when the when Governor Rowland um, sought to nominate me, um, it was because I was on a commission that was designed, uh, put together by Chief Justice Ellen Peters, um, looking into the disparity of youths, black youths being overrepresented in the system. So, uh, and then I did my work with the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities and Governor Rowland sent his legal counsel out to speak to me about becoming a judge. And I remember seeing this person and he says, uh, the governor wants you to apply to become a judge. And I go, okay. Um, he said, you're going to do it, right? And I said, yes. I was in the middle of a big trial. <laughs> I, I did my trial and forgot all about it. Um, and then I ran into the governor and he said, um, you know, did Brendan talk to you? And I said, yes. And he says, um, and you didn't apply. And I said, well, you know, governor, I'm sorry, really got busy and I had to do some other stuff. And he says, well, put your application in. I forgot again. It wasn't until the third time that I had contact with the governor's office. And he looked at me and he said, I've never asked anybody twice, let alone three times, um, put your application in. So I said, okay. And he said, and call me when you do. <laughs> so that was the incentive to call him after. And he said, yeah, I know they've already reported to me that you filed the application, your hearings on a certain date. I went there, I called him up to tell him I went through the hearing and he said, I know you've been approved. You're on the short list. Don't do anything stupid. Um, and so that, that's how I got on, on the, uh, uh, the list to become a judge, but it wasn't that I intended to become a judge. I got involved in my community, whether it was the NAACP, um, whether it was, uh, 
mentoring uh, young people. Um, whatever I could do to make this world a better place, I did. And that gave me the background to become a judge and I, I think a better judge. But that also gave me context with all those people who could make me a judge. It wasn't deliberate. It was just something that happened. But you need more than skill um, to become a judge, especially if you're not an elected judge. You need to know people and meet people. And that's what I did. But it was while doing stuff that I enjoyed. No, knowing, knowing people, making the connections, um, they open up opportunities that you may never have expected. Absolutely. I've been offered jobs the same way. And it was like, wow, um, that's incredible. So yeah. that networking thing, but yeah. don't network just for the sake of network. I love lawyering. I, I can't tell you how much I love it. I love lawyering, love everything about it. And because of that, I was looking, you know, under every rock and doing things like that. And that's how I got to where I am. So here we are. And um, my last question before we open it up to any Q&A we may have. Um, you and I, uh, seems like yesterday we were, we were young people starting out in our career journeys. And here we are closer to the end of it than the, uh, than the beginning of it. Uh, what, um, that gets me sometimes thinking about, you know, what, what my and our legacy might, might be. What would you like your legacy in life and your career to be? What would you like to be remembered for? That I made a difference, that I made the world a fairer place, that the judicial system, which is the backbone of our democracy, became stronger, that I helped build trust, the, the public trust in our institutions. Um, I, I hear the Star Spangled Banner whenever I, I talk. I, I love this country. I love our systems. It's deeply flawed, but either I can sit back and complain about it or I can change it. Mm -hmm. And I've chosen to change it in every way that I can. Your, your open letter to the judiciary in June was, was magnificent. And I think that will be part of your legacy to make those statements and to lead. And that was, that was picked up and followed nationally and it very well should have been. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would love to share that with the law school as well. Um, phenomenal letter. And thank you for your remarks. The Q&A is open and we have, right now we only have one question um, and it's a very... It's an, a phenomenal question from an anonymous okay. attendee. They've shared that students of color, um, the more that they learn about the law and structural racism embedded within the law, the more they lose faith in the system. And they wonder as a law student, how can they be a part of a system that fights against them and suppresses them and their people? Clearly you've done a lot of good for Connecticut and justice generally. What can you tell these students who feel conflicted with the injustice inherent in the law and their professional identities moving forward? Yeah, what I've, I've told you, people, and, it, and sometimes I, I'd say it rather forcefully because I believe it's true. Either you can accept the status quo or you can change it. That's your two options. You know, there's no other options. I chose not to accept it. I hope they choose not to accept it. Um, you know, I, I keep thinking about Fannie Lou Hamer's remarks about I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. But what are my options? Surrender or fight? Surrender is not an option for me. So you are at the beginning of your career, at the beginning of a wonderful career. You will become one of the most powerful people in this country, a person who knows how to use the law to achieve those things that you want to achieve. It's not gonna be easy. You're gonna have victories, you're gonna have losses, but that's life. Go in there and fight that fight, win that battle, win that case. Do pro bono work. One of the things that I found that's really, really soothes my soul was when I would get out there and do a pro bono case. I, I've probably litigated thousands of cases as an attorney and I've tried thousands of cases as a judge and I'm getting up to a thousand cases of, of, of appellate decisions. Um, the most, the cases that are the, the clearest in my mind is my pro bono work. People who needed my help, who really, really were thankful for it. 
And I got to change their life. And quite frankly, sometimes got to change the system by doing it. Fantastic. We have another question in the Q&A from future Justice Douglas Clemens. He's a 1L and he appreciates your time being here. He was born and raised on the west side of Stanford right. during the crack <laughs> area that sent all the men in my family to prison. And he feels like the system really hasn't changed. And it's sort of playing off of the last answer. Um, he'd like to know what to do to, that kept you going. How did the realities of the implicit bias in the judicial system not dishearten you? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I also grew up on the west side. I, I grew up on Stillwater Avenue and then Taylor Street over near Fairfield Avenue. Um, and that was a rather rough part of town. Um, I saw what was going on. And, and this goes back to my, my previous answer. Um, I wasn't willing to accept it. So what I started doing was training judges about him. I learned about implicit bias and, and uh, racial anxiety and those things. Um, and I started to teach courses on it. In Connecticut, we have our own judicial college um, and we train, we have a train the trainer model. And so we train other judges in what to do. Now, I know that things are sort of dark um, these days I, and I get that, but here's something that's really interesting. The last training that I did was for the judiciary in Alabama. I've done one for the judiciary in South Carolina. I've done one in Louisiana. I've done them in Indiana. I did one in Idaho. So think about that. Judicial branches from all over the country will pay my transportation and put me up in a hotel so they can hear a lecture on racial anxiety, so they can hear a lecture on implicit bias. And when I bring those lectures, and I'd be glad to, I, I'd be glad to do a presentation for uh, Roger Williams. Um, and I can do them virtually. Um, so when I do that, I bring my stories with them. One of the ways you can really get people to understand what you're trying to say is to tell your story. Because guess what? You can think what you want to think. And as I said in that letter um, to the judicial branch, you're entitled to your own opinions, but not your own facts. And I can present those facts and I can tell you what impact they had on me and my family and my loved ones. By telling that story, I found that people react in a more positive way in a more reactive way. So I'm trying to change places that, you know, you would think that are unchangeable. Um, I found the reaction in the deep South where my biases were saying that they're not going to listen, that they're not going to accept this. I found that I actually was pretty successful in those trips and, and giving those lectures. So you, you can't leave the status quo. You, you got to change it. Thank you for that. We have a question in the chat from Cass D. Carvalho, who's a part of the Thurgood Marshall Law Society here in Rhode Island, and he sends his sincere thanks. Any single regrets, acts, or omissions for which you'd take a do-over if possible? Um, yes. Um, you know, th there's always, a, you know, when you do criminal, uh, when you're sending the criminal side of, of things, there are times when you second guess. Um, there was a young man who um, he was hit with three uh, mandatory minimums. There was nothing I could do about it. This was a, a kid who grew up in the rough part of Norwalk, Connecticut, um, actually was making it out of that situation, doing pretty well. He was in college. He gets popped for selling drugs within 1500 feet of a school. In the town of Nor the city of Norwalk, um, there is only two very small areas that aren't within 1500 feet of a prohibited zone, which means that if you sold anything, marijuana, cocaine, whatever, you probably want to get hit with an enhanced penalty or a mandatory minimum. I had to sentence this kid knowing that he, it would probably destroy his life. And there wasn't a darn thing I could, I hate mandatory minimums. Um, I thought this, this young man was salvageable. I actually did the sentence, but I ran them. The best I could do was run them concurrently instead of consecutively. Um, but to this day, I wonder what happened to him. And so you know, things like that do happen. 
Thank you. Honest and difficult. Uh, we have a question from our Dean of Students, Lorraine Lally. Our democracy is currently being challenged, especially the relationship between the executive and the legislative branch. What challenges to the judiciary do you anticipate? Um, one of the biggest challenges is trying to figure out the role, figure out what the courts are supposed to do. Um, we are the quiet branch of government and uh, we are easily criticized. And that is that may not seem important to some people, but it's very important to me. As I said, people have to believe in our systems in order for our system to work. Um, after the social unrest of, of 2020, I mean, think about last year, 2020 was a remarkable time in history. After George Floyd's death, more than half the chief justices and Supreme Courts of the various states and the various territories of the United States came out and spoke about the racial disparity in sentences, sentencing. They spoke about the uh, unequal access to justice. They spoke about the increasing digital divide. These are things that courts didn't speak about before. So there's been this shift, this remarkable shift that courts are beginning to look at their own selves and see the injustices that we were perpetuating. Um, so we can do things in a better way. We can start giving better access to justice. But a bigger thing than that is, I think one of the biggest problems we have in America today is people don't understand their role as citizens of the United States. People don't understand what government does. They don't understand what the courts do. You, you hear people saying, well, the judge will do that. The judge will change that. Um, this last election, you know, it'll go to court and the courts will do this. And it's like, no, we have to apply the rule of law. One of the things that we all need to do and especially the younger attorneys, you need to make a commitment to educate the public about what your role is, about what courts do, about how government works. The, an informed citizenry is the best defense of our democratic republic. And we all have to do that. We, we ignore this problem way too long. Start your own civics first programs, which is these programs that you start with children in elementary school and you do mock trials uh, and they learn how to do a mock trial or a moot court. Now we have in Connecticut, we have a moot court competition uh, that is fierce. And I've seen uh, people in high school and junior high school, I, do not repeat this, but they're better than some of the attorneys who appear before me. <laughs> Just don't repeat that. <laughs> well, this is Rhode Island, so you'll, we'll never know. This isn't um, being recorded, you're fine. Okay, good. <laughs> but yeah, we, we, we need to do a better job of educating the public. Uh, that I think would be the number one thing that I think needs to be done right now. And that's easily done. And even as a 1L, you can go back to your, when you go home uh, for the break, you can go back to your school and offer them uh, to, to meet with the kids and, and explain to them what your role as a lawyer is. That's something easy to do. It's half an hour of your time and you will be educating the public. Fantastic. Uh, I know that we are over our time and Chief Justice Robinson has graciously given us extra time to answer. How's everybody doing? Everybody's okay? Keep on going. How are you doing, Your Honor? I I'm fine with that. Um, I, I would have, uh, I was thinking of, of when I was doing my keynote address, are you, are you familiar with it? Uh, oh, Mark Twain uh, saying that, I, I would have written a shorter letter if I had had the time. <laughs> I would have written a shorter speech if I had the time. No, it was, it was needed and, and it was phenomenal. Um, we have some, I mean, some phenomenal questions. We have our future Supreme Court nominee, Christina Rawls. Many critique philosophy, East and West, and are trying to get rid of it in higher education. But law and philosophy have a long, complex, and beautiful history of both teaching critical thinking. Thoughts on the need for continued collaborations between them? Um, that's, that's a really good question. Um, let me put it this way. I, I, I do have a bias towards philosophy. We have one of the permanent clerks at the Supreme Court in Connecticut who is a philosophy major. And um, we sit and talk all the time about uh, uh, philosophy and how that thread runs through our cases. So I think it's really important 
um, and critical thinking is being attacked. And I, I don't understand that. I'll be honest with you. I don't understand people attacking critical thinking. I want all of us to, to do that. Um, so, uh, so th that's that's my answer. That uh, it's definitely needed. Um, I would press on with it. Um, there are going to be people. You're never going to be able to satisfy everybody. Um, I think it's the right way to go. You think it's the right way to go. So, uh, what I would do is do like I said a couple of questions earlier. You work that in. You do that. Um, that's the best way to keep it alive. That's great. Another anonymous question. Um, what is your response to those who get upset when we talk about race and the law or who might say that not everything has to do with race? Yeah. You have to figure out a way to, and, and here's the problem with uh, discussions. It, it takes two people. And so you can either figure out a way to keep that person at the table and talking or you can let them go. I, found, I find that it's critical now to keep people at the table. And I use my skills. Uh, for most of my career on the bench, I was a court annexed mediator. And I found that in mediation, the best way to get people to reach an agreement is to figure out what they're looking for, what their need is, and to take care of that need. And these difficult conversations one of the most critical things you can do is listen as well as talk. Uh, my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Harris, used to always say, there is a reason why we have two ears and one mouth. Um, and so you have to listen twice as hard. And so when that person who that you're talking to says, why does everything have to be about race? I would sit there and try to figure out a way to tell them, because it is about race. <laughs> Um, but they're not going to hear that if you just shout at them. You are learning as attorneys. You're learning how to argue. You're learning how to be civil towards each other. I'll go back to what I said earlier. If you have the better argument, you will win the day. But if you have to shout someone down, if you have to be uncivil, if you make them disengage, you've lost. So figure out ways. And you know what? If you hone the skill, you can use that in the courtroom too. So all these things that are tough to do, if you really work at them, you will become a better lawyer. If you find that you're lacking in it, then find ways to get better at it. Um, that If that means going back to school and, and learning more about psychology and those kinds of things, I'm not against you know going to my local community college and taking a course. Um, you have to continue educating yourself. One of the things that my family does is we're all martial artists. Um, my wife is a sixth degree black belt. I'm a fourth degree black belt. My son is a fourth degree black belt. I know some of you are thinking, have we ever sparred against each other? Um, yes. If you want to know who went, who won, let me just put it this way. Winning is not everything. Um, you can learn more from a loss than you can from a win. And I won't tell you who won. That's, that's all I have to say about that. Um, but in martial arts, you're constantly training. You will never, you don't do martial arts, you practice martial arts. You don't do law, you practice law. You don't do medicine, you practice medicine. You will be working at becoming a better lawyer every single day of your life. That's if you want to be a good one. That's if you want to be a good one. And the good ones, they're constantly improving themselves. Fantastic. We've got time for probably one more question. And I'm going to go to future Justice Brittany Hayes. Clearly, there are a lot of race issues in New England, even though it has the reputation of being more liberal than the rest of the country. Do white liberals have more of an impact within more conservative parts of the country? Or does New England have a trickle down effect on the country? She's not really sure where to practice. Um, I, I... I'm the type who wouldn't let that influence where I was going to practice. Um, I, I wouldn't not let the situation dictate my life. I would dictate the situation. Um, the, what sort of stands out to me about that is there's sort of, it starts on a false premise, which is that New England is thought to be liberal. Um, there are probably some people who think that. Uh, there are people who think that Connecticut was a very liberal progressive state. Connecticut enforced the Fugitive Slave Act. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, it did. If you if you think about Griswold versus Connecticut, Connecticut was on the side against birth control. Um, so it's it's one of these things where um, we have the reputation of being liberal. But if you look at it historically, that's not quite what the situation was. There are more. There are some southern states who actually were more liberal than the New England states. Uh, there was a reason why New England was called up south. Um, but uh, I'm going to go back to what I said before. You don't let that situation dictate your future. You make your future. I went to school, to law school in West Virginia, um, and. Uh, Dean Bowman can can vouch me on this for me on this. In 19, I started school in 1981. I graduated in 1984. The West Virginia state constitution still said that whites and colored shall not be taught in the same school building. That then changed until 1994, uh, 10 years after I graduated. And even then it was a, a referendum and it was close. Um, if I had let that kind of thing dictate my future, I don't think I would be a chief justice now. I don't think I'd be a judge now. When I went there, um, I went there knowing that. And I actually started trying to change things then. Uh, I started a movement to get scholarships for qualified African-American students uh, because the, scholarship, the counties that they tended to live in didn't have scholarships. And West Virginia has what, 42 counties? It's 55, but who's counting? Okay, it's, it's been a while. Um, but where the blacks are concentrated is, is in one particular area. Um, and so, and I was able to get the school to do it. Mm-hmm. I didn't benefit a penny from that, but it was the right thing to do. And you know what? That just made me feel good. And I think that helped me build the character that I am today. Oh, Judge, thank you so very much for your time. You went way over time. You said it all. Um, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it, especially now without having the kind of sense of community of being on campus. Like all you have to do is look at the attendees and the fact that people are still here. This is so awesome that you're here and we appreciate it so much. Um, it's usually at this point, we would hand you like a a token of our appreciation, but now it's weirdly this awkward moment. It's like, we're going to mail something to you. But (laughs) one of the things that I do plan on mailing to you. It's um, Advil for all the migraines <laughs> and perhaps for some of the beatings that you have taken and maybe the sparring matches that you may or may I, not have won. But I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you have to ask been, my wife. <laughs> it's been a joy to, to meet you. And I know that we will certainly get you to Bristol and this will not be the last time that we engage with you. Um, Dean Bowman, did you have any closing remarks as well? I just want to thank everyone for being here. Um, and to all of our wonderful staff colleagues who helped organize this. And Chief Justice, thank you for being here with us and imparting your wisdom and sharing your story and for being my friend and our friend. We really appreciate it. And uh, you have made the world a better place in your life and you are not close to being done yet. Well, thank you. I am very proud to know you. I'm very proud to call you a friend. I'm very proud to learn from you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I appreciate our friendship and, and I honor it. And the only thing I ask in return is send me some clerks. <laughs> we promise to send you clerks and all the students on the call, you hear this. Uh, we um, got to send you great, great, great graduates. To well, I spoke to, uh, uh, I emailed uh, Nicole and I spoke to Chris and they're both willing to help, uh, help me come and, and talk uh, to the students there about clerking and they can tell their experience. And I, I kid you not, they were two of the best clerks we've ever had. We've got great students. We, we graduate great lawyers. So we'll, we'll help you out. We promise. Thank you. Thank you again. And thank you to everyone for being here with us. Tonight. Yeah. I want to give a big thank you again to Nixon Peabody, Reka and Andrew. Thank you so much for making this event possible. And just a couple of quick notes for some events that are coming up this Friday, our black law student association is hosting the third installment of sister talks. So that's going to be happening on Friday the 19th at 6 p.m. And finally, the Multicultural Student Union, our partners on the undergrad side, is hosting Youssef Salam of the Central Park Five, now the Exonerated Five. And this virtual engagement is happening on Tuesday, February 23rd at 7.30. It's going to be a keynote from Youssef, um, some Q&A and an opportunity to engage there. So please 
check your email and we will be sending all of that out shortly. Um, and I think that's everything. that's everything. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. All right. Thank you all. Bye-bye.